Welcome to Playwright to Playwright, an online interview series presented by Queen's Theatre at Home. You are listening to the audio description pre-show notes for the interview. Because the format is fairly simple and the talking is continuous, there will be no audio description during the interview itself. The video begins with a title screen. The Queen's Theatre logo fills the left side of the screen. The logo resembles the letter Q. The circle of the Q is orange, and the rectangular tail is black. The text of the title screen reads, Playwright to Playwright with Rob Urbanati and special guest Ginny Lynn Bader. Originally recorded April 29th, 2021. Technical production, Jay Rogers. The Queen's Theatre at Home text logo is on the right side of the screen throughout the interview. The word Queen's is in orange, and the word theatre is in black. The interview consists of close-ups of Rob and Ginny Lynn in a split screen, with Rob on the left and Ginny Lynn on the right. At times, when Ginny Lynn is speaking, a close-up of her fills the screen. Rob is in his 60s with close-cut dark hair and a round face. He is in his living room and wears a black t-shirt with the Queen's Theatre logo on it. Ginny Lynn is sitting in an armchair in a room with a bookcase on her left side and a light orange wall on her right. She has a thin, angular face with long brown hair falling below her shoulders and onto the front of her black jacket. Hello, and welcome to episode 12 of Playwright to Playwright. My name is Rob Urbanati, and I'm director of New Play Development at Queen's Theatre. Today, I'll be speaking with Jenny Lynn Bader, a good friend and an extremely prolific playwright. I'm eager to hear how Jenny Lynn has used her time during the pandemic and also about her association with Theater 167 and the company's productions at Queen's Theater. So let's begin. Hi, Jenny Lynn. Hi, Rob. Where does this find you? Where is that orange wall? I'm in New York City, in the Upper West Side. Excellent, just where I expected you to be. So um, we've known each other a while now, many um, adventures we've shared over the years. And I think we met at the Lincoln Center Director's Lab when you were a playwright in residence or something like that. And I was a director in residence or a lab no, director. I think we met around then. I think it may have even been a little bit earlier through Daniela Verone, which was also through the Lincoln Center Director's Lab because you that guys were right. in the lab at the same time. And I think she recommended you to direct a play reading of mine at the new group. And I think, um, you know, you did that. And, and But it was also around that same time that we were both in a, a series of the Lincoln Center Directors Lab that was produced at the Culture Project back when people went to see theater in places and went indoors and before we were all living on Zoom. Wow, you um, have a memory, like a steel trap. Um, was this the reading with Ann Jackson? Yes. yes. Travel agency play? Yes. Ann Jackson. I love that play. Thank you. I think it's beautiful. I remember Ann had not done a lot of readings and um, we had to go over everything line by line, but those were early days for readings actually, thinking about it now. Anyway, um, let's jump to the present. So um, the pandemic has changed all our lives, but you've been very busy, I noticed. Please tell us about what you've been up to this past year. Yeah, I've been incredibly uh, uh, busy during the pandemic and I feel like there's been this kind of strange divide where everything physical in our business has been eliminated, destroyed, shuttered, indefinitely postponed, had its very existence threatened. But then everything non-physical, uh, ideas and forms and kind of pushing the envelope of what, what genre can be and what plays can be and what casting can look like and uh, what, the, what the future is. There's just been an enormous amount of, of spiritual growth and working on a lot of uh, virtual plays and audio plays has made me think a lot about what theater is. Cause you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, some people were saying, well, that's not theater. If you don't do it on a stage, it's not theater. And, and all, there was a lot of criticism, you know, of, of a lot of this kind of genre bending and, and Zoom theater. But for me, in a way, theater used to be defined partially by sitting in a common space sharing a common space and you know, having that experience. And I'm increasingly thinking about theater more as the art of making the impossible possible. And just 
thinking of, of all of the things it can be. And for me, at first, the pandemic itself served as a little bit of a muse. And it, it inspired some writing for me, sort of pretty, pretty early on, the first few things I wrote during the pandemic were responsive to the pandemic. And I, I don't know how, how you feel about how your plays come about, Rob, but I feel a plays come about in sort of a few different ways for me. Uh, one way is that there's an idea you're thinking about or obsessing over, over a period of years. And the play has sort of nothing to do with what's going on in the world at this very second, but it's a, an idea you've developed over time and it you know, connects to things in the, in the current moment, but isn't necessarily coming from them. And then there are the plays that come from assignments or commissions or invitations where you're given something to think about and it really inspires something for you, something you might've created anyway. And that can be wonderful too. But then there are the moments where something happens in the world and you have to respond to it. You can't ignore it. It, it just demands some kind of uh, imaginative response. And I felt the pandemic was one of those times. You know, I'm not always someone who's writing about topics ripped from today's headlines, but I really felt what there, sort of an urgency about it, uh, about this particular cultural moment. And I immediately wrote several things, um, or in the first few months of the pandemic, I wrote several things that I had no idea what I was writing them for. You know, I, I wrote A Guru of Touch, and that was a play responding to the whole kind of movement of life onto Zoom. And it was about a healer who tries to move his hands-on healing seminar onto Zoom and the, you know, the hilarity that ensues from that. And then I wrote a piece called The Door Was Open, which was uh, kind of set during the time of the toilet paper shortages. And it took place in a convenience store with a virtual clerk. And then I also wrote a piece called Pacific Coast Trail, which was about a guy who kind of missed the beginning of the pandemic because he was on a very long hike and kind of came back and literally walked into this un unrecognizable situation uh, leading to kind of a series of crescendoing conflicts with his partner uh, because he partially couldn't believe some of the things she was telling him and uh, partially was kind of, you know, fish out of water, uh, not really uh, yet attuned, uh, acclimated as we all have become to the, to the situation. And, uh, a lot of the time when you write something like that, that you know has no theater or producer or uh, invitation connected to it, it doesn't necessarily go anywhere. It ends up being a homeless play, uh, orphaned play, but uh, all of these plays, there ended up being a, a need and interest in this uh, kind of thing I've been working on. So a guru of touch ended up having a site-specific Zoom production in the Edinburgh Festival Fringe. Uh, so that was exciting. I got to go to virtual Scotland, though I've never been to real Scotland. And I, I got to participate in that festival, which has always been a, a dream of mine. Um, the door was open uh, also to travel to Europe. It ended up being published in Plays International and Europe Magazine, which was a very, very exciting because they were actually looking for coronavirus themed pieces from both sides of the Atlantic. And um, Pacific Coast Trail ended up being done on the West Coast at, in a virtual production by Outcast Productions. And, and so, so part of all my writing in the pandemic had to do with, with that, with the, that it was an inspiration in itself. But also I started getting a lot of opportunities that I wouldn't have had and of course, a lot of things also had been canceled and you know destroyed and jettisoned and, and uh, indefinitely postponed. That was always a big one, indefinitely postponed. But um, at the be at the beginning of the pandemic, some of the people said, "You can't write anything right now. This is a horrible time. Everybody should stop writing." You know. But then there were a, a few things started to come my way. Like there was a, a contest at Urban Stages, the acronym plays, and I felt inspired to write a play where one character speaks entirely in acronyms and it's called CEO and they didn't do virtual productions yet but they you know they put all the scripts on their on their website of, uh, of all the all the contest winners and then um, I was invited to be a part of voting rights at Luna Stage which would never have happened 
uh, under normal circumstances because that was actually, I mean, it was a program that was planned, but it was going to be just New Jersey writers. It was gonna just be local writers and they were gonna have their meetings locally at that theater. And then they were going to do this play that was supposed to inspire civic participation and engagement for the people on the stage there. It was going to do that kind of inspiration, but in New Jersey. And suddenly when the pandemic came, I mean, they had to go back to the NEA and sort of ask if they could change what their project was and everything. But they started to realize, wait, if we're having these meetings online instead of in New Jersey, we could invite all kinds of people to write for this. And if we're having these, you know, plays by all kinds of people from all over the place, the audience can be from all over the place and they can be from red states and blue states and purple states. And we can inspire civic engagement and participation and have this conversation, this political cultural conversation all over. So suddenly there was a world of possibility with what this project could do. And I wrote this piece my first time which was set in three different historical eras simultaneously which of course you could do on the stage also but it's kind of in some ways it lent itself to Zoom. Um, and then I was also uh, invited to write a play for a high school. I wrote a play with Martin Sandville and it's called Strange Happenings at the School Library. And it's about an, a librarian who moves into the school library during the pandemic and then starts to look in the books and the books aren't what she thought they would be. And, you know, a Tweedledee and Tweedledum or social distancing and all, all kinds of crazy things are happening inside the books. And the question is, how can the library get the books to go back to normal? So uh, the pandemic was a, a news of sorts uh, for, for that too. Um, I was in, invited by a temple to write a forum play, which I don't think would have happened under nor normal circumstances. And uh, I was able to attend my work in different places. Um, I was part of a virtual program called Rose and Villains uh, at Urban Stages. I was part of a collaboration about for, on a play that could, you could listen to in your bathtub that has now streamed in 30 countries. And uh, some of these kind of international things led to me being approached by a producer in Europe to write a new audio play about changing human consciousness. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of really exciting things have happened. And also unexpected things have happened to things I wrote before. So for example, The International Local, which is an audio play I wrote before the pandemic, and it's part of the Subway Plays app. That piece, you know, we first released it, I think in 2018, it became part of the New York International Fringe Festival in 2019. In 2020, we were gonna try to do some physical launch where we actually invited people to ride the subway with us and listen to it. It's a site-specific piece set on the subway. There were three different subway lines covered by the three playwrights at my play set on the seven train. And we never, you know, because of all the, you know, everyone being busy and then the pandemic, we never had the physical event to promote the play and we could never figure out how to promote this play. And then because of the pandemic, shutting all the theaters, suddenly the New York Times reviewed this audio play. And we got this wonderful review. And it was so strange because, you know, when we were making the play, the director said, oh, well, uh, you can only uh, really listen to this play on the subway. And I would say, well, you could kind of listen to it at home because I wanted to send it to my friends, you know, in foreign places. And she said, no, no, it really is best to listen to on the subway. And then the New York Times critics said, actually, it's kind of great to listen to this play now that we're missing the subway. <laughs> you know, it's nostalgia for the subway. So, uh, so a lot of kind of uh, strange things happened during the pandemic. I also taught a lot um, during the pandemic and in ways that I wouldn't have. I taught classes um, in, I, I gave a guest lecture in Florida and I gave a guest lecture upstate and uh, I taught two classes uh, at Luna Stage, uh, sort of more extended classes. And, you know, some of this teaching, I've done teaching before and some of it would have been possible, but it would have been a lot of, you know, traveling. And uh, it was kind of uh, amazing of having, not only teaching classes in different places, but also having students in many different states you know, during these classes. So that was interesting. And also being invited to talk on, on subjects I hadn't been invited to talk 
on before. Uh, and I, I realized, oh, I, I have a lecture about putting together a solo play. Oh, wait a second. I can do a five, you know, a 10 hour class on writing the 10 minute play. And I want to discuss that with you. Jenny Lynn, this is also fascinating to hear because um, I just assumed you were lounging about doing <laughs> absolutely nothing, watching Netflix for the past year. There's been a bit of Netflix, I must admit. <laughs> it's, um, it's incredible the amount of work you've accomplished. And it's interesting because I started to do these interviews um, right after the pandemic you know, began, so like a year ago. And at that time, the, the playwrights that I was talking to were like sort of gobsmacked by the idea of the pandemic and kind of didn't know where to turn. So it's really interesting now, um, first of all, just to hear how productive you've been, but also to hear of, you speak of the pandemic as a muse and as providing opportunities. I think we've transitioned into something regarding the pandemic, looking at it differently. I'm just curious, do you think that some of these opportunities that presented themselves, some you're talking about ca being able to cast people and reach audiences from yeah. across the globe. Do you think some of that will continue post pandemic? Yeah, I'd love to figure out what we can bottle from the pandemic and keep the, you know, the parts that we're grateful for, the ability to collaborate with people who are, you know, the, the casts I could get for some of these online readings or virtual productions were incredible. And these were people who would never have been simultaneously able to be in a single room, but because they were in different places, they could do it. Um, yeah, I do. I do think there's going to be, you know, certainly some play development that happens online more than before. Possibly some rehearsals uh, happening online more than before. And um, and I also would would love to know how to sort of bottle the mute audience function for when we get back for the obnoxious heckler. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love your term bottle. Yeah, because if we could learn from and um, expand as you started, I believe your response to the question by saying, expand what our ideas of theater are because of what we've learned in the pandemic, that would be a beautiful thing. I wanna riff off something you mentioned, uh, 10 minute plays. And I know you've written a bunch of those. Many of them have been published. I'm assuming that some of the plays you wrote during the pandemic were 10-minute plays. Can you talk about that as a form? Uh, obviously, you consider it a valid form. Did you always? And I also wanted to hear your thoughts on one-minute plays, which, again, what about yes, I, that form? I, I've written several one-minute plays. One of them for the one-minute play pandemic festival that happened early in the pandemic. Uh, yet the way... You know, I, I thought about this a lot because, you know, I taught these classes on the 10 minute play and the image I gave my class for the 10 minute play is a Persian miniature. And so the idea is it's not that a 10 minute play is missing any elements of a full length play any more than a Persian miniature is missing any elements of a full, you know, a larger painting. Um, all the elements are there, the color, the contrast, the texture, the brush strokes, the composition, or in the case of the 10 minute play, the character development, the story, the story turns, the surprise uh, reversals. So, um, you know, ideally beginning, middle and end. You know, so I think that the idea is that it, the challenge of a 10 minute play is that it needs to have all the elements of a full length play. It needs to have a theme. It needs to have strong characters, but it has to take up much less space in the world the way a person miniature takes up, you know, much less space uh, on the wall. And uh, that's, you know, that can be really hard to do. I think, you know, there's a long history of the 10 minute play. Um, and at first it became kind of a way to group some celebrated writers together in a literary collection in an evening in a way that you couldn't go to all these celebrated writers and ask them to write you know, a full play for you. And then after that, it sort of became more of a way for theaters to nurture unheard of writers or newer or emerging writers and not waste too much time on any of them, but kind of bring a bunch in together to sort of develop and, and work on. So I think there's 
a lot of good reasons to become conversant in the 10 minute play form, but you also want to be flexible and be able to write plays of different length. At The Lark, I remember talking about this with uh, the late Arthur Copet, who recently passed, and he felt that 10 minute plays were kind of, in some ways, uh, hurting the landscape of the short play. Because if, you know, someone had an idea for a 15 or 17 minute play, they would instead write it as a 10 minute play, be kind of more marketable because of all these different 10 minute play opportunities. I see, yeah. In fact, at Queens Theater, you know, we've done a lot of what were called 10 minute play festivals, as, as you know, and as we're gonna discuss in a minute. But lately, we've changed the terminology to short plays because, well, again, riffing off the one minute play, it's possible for the plays to be super short, but as Mr. Copet, I think, correctly acknowledged, there isn't any reason to sort of squeeze them into 10 minutes if 15 or 20 or, you know, a half an hour is fine. A play so wants to be as long as it wants to be. Exactly that. So I think just saying short plays, meaning not mm -hmm. full length, and correct me if I'm wrong here in the terminology discussion, but they're not quite one acts either, which sort of a closer to an hour. Is that how what you're thinking is? Right. No, it used to be that. That now, now you can also have the full length one, you know, didn't used to be possible. But I, you know, the way I see it, there's a history of plays going from being five acts to then four and then three, and then, you know, the long, you know, full length one act without intermission. And it, it's all part of the declining American attention span, which I think has gotten even more declined during pandemic times. So that's probably why there was a call, you know, there's so many calls for short plays at this time. Yeah. People, there's also a lot of people not, not exposed to short plays before found they liked watching, right? Because now you can just turn on your computer. There were some earlier versions of that before the pandemic, but it just became more widespread. Yeah, and I wonder if post pandemic or in the, this reopening phase, if shorter plays are gonna become even more prominent with people not mm -hmm. wanting intermissions perhaps um, not having to deal with, you know, bathrooms and um, bars downstairs of theaters. What do you think? Well, I'm also very interested in what is going to happen to timing in general, right, of plays. Mm. Because now that you can watch a play at five o'clock, you can watch a play at nine o'clock, you know, are people going to want the curtain always to be at eight? And, you know, the, the very first show that... Um, sort of open for a significant run, the, uh, the one at the Daryl Roth Theater Blindness based on the Saramago novel, that has all kinds of show times. You know, obviously also they don't have actors, so <laughs> it's a little bit different, but it's, it's a performance, a, a virtual multimedia performance that has, I think they have show times at three and five and seven. And, and it's, I mean, it's a conversation that's been happening um, I think among people with kids for a long time, you know, why is the theater curtain always have to be at, at this time? But I think it's also seeping in sort of more, more generally to uh, other parts of the community where would we get more people if some things were screened? Would we get more people if things were at different times? Uh, you know, if they were shorter, if they didn't have intermission, you know, a lot of, a lot of big questions that just kind of got that's really interesting. I hadn't thought of that at all, whether we'll be entering a world of alternate times for plays. That's very, that makes me very happy. That's very compatible with my idea of theater going to be able to head over to a theater at any time of the day or night. Um, that would be really interesting. I hadn't thought of that at all. I'd love to talk with you about your experiences at Queens Theater. So we did with a company that you co-founded that I'd love to hear you talk about, Theater 167. <clears throat> we did two of your evenings of short plays. Short plays, were they all 10 minutes, Jenny Lynn? They, were, they weren't short plays. They were full-length, collaboratively written plays. Yeah. And you also did participate in two of our short play festivals, World's, Pl World's Fair Plays and Park Plays. I'm interested to hear about all of those things, Start maybe starting with Theater 167 and okay. how that came to be. Well, the idea of Theater 167 sort of came originally out of something that Ari Creek read about the 
emergency room at Elmhurst Hospital allegedly having 167 distinctly translatable languages spoken there. And uh, the idea of the theater was when it was started and we um, ended up doing some other things, but the initial idea was to create theater inspired by the world's most culturally diverse community. And our sort of big love song to the neighborhood was the Jackson Heights trilogy, which is three full length collaboratively written plays inspired by Jackson Heights. And the sort of idea of collaboratively written changed as we went along in the first play, uh, 167 Tongues, you're right, it felt more like kind of some short pieces that had been put together and then we found some connections between them. But the second play, we actually started to collaborate earlier in the process and share characters sooner and uh, merge characters sooner and involve a little bit more con sort of dramaturgical conversation earlier. And then by the third play, we were actually writing toward a common event that was decided before we began. We were including actors in the development process and asking them what roles they wanted to play. We were going into the neighborhood uh, and doing research together. And at one point we interviewed a cop together who offered to bring us on a sting operation. And a lot of really crazy things happened. What I remember distinctly about bringing Jackson Heights 3 AM to Queens Theater is that Queens Theater had, had basically you know, commissioned that play. And so it was a play that was planned, but not yet written. And I had dealt with this kind of idea before and since, but never quite exactly in the way that it happened at Queen's Theater, which is that because the, the timelines were so, you know, you guys are such a major institution, so the timelines were so much longer than we were used to dealing with, and the uh, production values were so great of your, you know, literature. So there was a very, very fancy brochure that was heralding and describing Jackson Heights 3 AM and listing the seven writers and the conceiver director uh, six months before we had written a word of this play. I did not know that. So maybe we had written a, a few words, but it was really, it, we definitely did not have a completed script. And there was this you know, beautiful glossy brochure and people could already purchase tickets to this play. And it wasn't, you know, I've actually had that happen to me before as a playwright where the brochure exists before the play is done. But at least, you know, it's all in your control because you can buckle down and do it. But here there are seven writers and what if one of them, you know, flaked out or one of them had an issue with the project, you know, what could happen? So it was a uh, it felt like a really a game changing moment for us as as a company. Well, that's really great to hear. Uh, it's it's interesting looking back on it now because your company, the company you co-founded, has um, lived through or experienced three executive directors at Queens Theater because um, it started when you first started. Jeff Rosenstock was mm -hmm. in charge, and then Ray Collum, and now um, the esteemed um, Taryn Sacramon. So. Um, I will say to you that Jackson Heights 3 AM is one of my all time favorite New York theater experiences. It's just an amazing piece. And I didn't understand, or I didn't, I wasn't aware that the idea of the collaboration evolved over the course of the three plays, but looking back at it, um, that makes perfect sense. And um, it seems kind of distinct to me in terms of a collective or a collaborative group that um, there would be that evolution. So. Um, yeah, I'm I fascinated like, by it. I feel yeah. like by the time we got to Jackson Heights 3 AM, we really had sort of cracked collaboration in a new way. And it was much harder to tell the difference between who wrote which scene. And, you know, it was, it was much more of a whole. Uh, I'd love to hear more about Mrs. Stern Wanders the Prussian State Library, which had a production at Luna Stage. That production was really extraordinary for me because I feel like in all of my plays, I try to get beyond stereotypes and get people to realize that people aren't who you first 
think they are, and maybe they're even better than you think they are. And I'm very interested in, you know, finding our common humanity and bringing people together. But that production seemed to bring people together, or at least to bring different viewpoints together in a way that I'd never experienced before in the sense that we live in a very politically divided, polarized country and it's getting increasingly polarized all the time and people are always talking about that and yet people of all different political viewpoints really responded to this production the most kind of conservative and conservative activist people I know and the most liberal and liberal activist people I know were all finding something to really respond to in this production and it made me think about all these conversations we have about we have to find common ground and I would think well you know, could this play be some kind of common ground? Was it your intention when you wrote the play for that to happen? I had no idea that was going to happen. I am dying to see that. And I um, hope that there is a New York production or a production somewhere that I can see, because it sounds amazing. It sounded amazing from the reviews I read, but from what you're describing about it, it sounds even more exciting. So yeah, there was, there was supposed to be a performing art center presentation and then it was supposed to be a New York production and I was offered it. you know, virtual, all kinds of things were supposed to happen, but pandemic, but we'll see. What are you gonna do next? Well, I'm very excited about the new site-specific interactive play uh, I've written, audio play I've written for Kathleen Chalfant called Tree Confessions. And that is now having its debut in Berlin at the Boys for Future International Exhibition uh, at the Gallery for Sustainable Art. Uh, this is probably another thing that would not have happened um, if not for pandemic. I would not be having a virtual audio play in Berlin. Uh, it's also going to be in the Edinburgh and Brighton festivals coming up. And then there's going to be a live version of it um, in East Hampton. Kathleen Chalfant is going to do in August at an outdoor event. So, um, that is that's really exciting because that's a play you can kind of you know when it when it comes out here you'll be able to listen to it on your phone and um just sit by a tree and and listen to it um and you know bring you closer to nature i think the pandemic has brought people closer to nature in really strange ways like i know where the sunlight is in my apartment now because i was stuck inside for so long and then i also am working on a new park project with prospect theater and riverside park which is near me. So I'm excited about that. So I feel that the future is, is outdoors. And I also just wrote um, one of the vaccine monologues for Luna Stage. So Excellent. Look out for that. That's the new V monologues, but they're about vaccines. As I think you know, we're doing, um, we're very likely doing some outdoor programming at Queens Theater this summer. So please keep me informed about um, Tree Confessions with the great Kathleen Chalfant. Big, big congratulations on all of your projects. It's been great talking with you. Um, I've really loved it. And um, I miss seeing you. And I look forward to seeing more of your work. And till next time, till we meet in person, maybe this summer, maybe this fall. That would um, be great. Please take care. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Jenny Lynn. Thanks so much, Jenny Lynn. That was fascinating. And thanks to all of you still at home, but hopefully not for long, for watching this episode of Playwright to Playwright. This is the last episode, for now at least, as Queen's Theatre is hoping to resume in-person productions this summer. Until then, please keep up with all Queen's Theatre at Home programming on social media by subscribing to our YouTube channel or on our website at www.queenstheatre.org. I'm Rob Urbanati, so until next time, stay safe and be happy. Thank you.